Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gorenson and welcome to Washington Grown. It's an agricultural commodity that provides many different products like wool, milk, and meat. This episode is all about sheep. We're in Seattle at one of famous chef Maria Hines restaurants, Tilt. It was imaginative, the ingredients combined very, very well. And we're cooking up a tasty lamb dish. Mmm, it's really delicate, like the whole dish mm -hmm. kind of comes together. Then we're heading to a shearing school to learn how to give the sheep a haircut. This is the part that I did, right there. <laughs> and we're in Bellingham at a sheep dairy to make some sheep cheese of our own. Mm. All this and much more on Washington Road. Are you ready to cook me up? Okay, I don't have the hang of this. So this is where we get our water. <laughs> Cheers. Hopefully they won't eat my shoelaces. <laughs> Seattle at Tilth, one of three restaurants owned by renowned chef Maria Hines. At Tilth, you'll feel like you're at home. The restaurant has a calming, intimate ambiance and, of course, exquisite dishes featuring Washington-grown food. I've spent a lot of time in Italy and the result that I had was absolutely outstanding. It was imaginative. The ingredients combined very, very well. I think unique into other restaurants that I've come to in Seattle and just really fresh. It was just an experience. I loved it. You've uh, cooked with Martha Stewart, you've been an Iron Chef. Kind of tell me a little bit about your journey as far as becoming a chef. I've been cooking for about 26 years now and spent some time cooking in Washington DC and Manhattan and France and San Diego. Tell me a little bit about, about Tilth. The cuisine is New American. Uh, we source as much as we can locally. I mean, that's kind of your thing is this showcasing the wonderful bounty that we have here in Washington. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's incredible products. So you moved here because of the food? Yeah. I have the opportunity to really meet face to face with the farmers and find out what they're growing and how they handle their product. Coming up, we're cooking one of Maria's favorites, some lamb with Washington cherries and cheesy grits. Mmm, a party for your mouth. You can put that on your menu. Oh, great. <laughs> Now, Tomas is off to visit Fustel Farms, a sheep farm in Whitman County, and they're putting him to work. So I'm here with Dr. Jill Swanick. This is a farm that has a rich history, is that right? It's been, you know, it was homesteaded by the Fustels. Um, our uh, family bought it in the 1960s, and uh, we've owned it ever since. What are some of the differences and similarities from raising cattle and raising sheep? Um, sheep tend to be labor intensive um, in that uh, we handle them more, we shear them, you know, we do some other things with them that way. Um, you know, if you like the sheep and, and the shearing and that way of life, at least, you know, in our hands in the Palouse is, is more profitable per acre than running cows. You have a lot of sheep on this farm. Yes, I do have a lot of sheep on <laughs> How this farm. Many do you have? I have no idea. But <laughs> that you, many. <laughs> you are welcome to count them today. <laughs> no, no. We sheared, and that's when we count actually, is when we shear. We sheared 1,300? 1,300. Is, yes. that a, is that a typical farm? You know, on the sheep side of things for Washington, it's, it's one of the larger ones. Okay. Um, you know, we have flocks that are probably over 5,000, but you know, just one or two. And then the majority of sheep in Washington are probably in groups of 10 or 20. We use the sheep here uh, for a couple different sustainable operations. You know, one, pasture management. The scab lands obviously aren't farmable, um, and so they can go out and graze that. And then in the fall, after we've harvested our wheat, we use the sheep to go in and, and eat the stubble and the crop residue. Um, and then the alfalfa that we grow, we feed through the deep part of winter when we just don't have pasture. And then we feed them through lambing and then the pastures are green and we turn them out with their lambs to graze. So we're going to deworm some sheep. Uh, just tell me a little bit more about the process of what I'm going to be doing out there when we're deworming. 
We're going to have you give an oral drench. So okay. you're going to squirt the medicine in their mouth. Oh, okay. Not too bad. No. Let's do that then. All right. <laughs> Look out, little lambs. Jill's giving me a drench gun. Let's see if this will fit around your waist. I like how she's making it bigger <laughs> for my waist. Did you see that at home? <laughs> Look, I have to tighten it. Yeah, hmm. there you go. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. You know, they're actually quite calm about this process. I guess they're used to it? No, they've never been done before. Oh, so these have never been no. dewormed. You hear that, guys? I'm your first dewormer. That's it. There we go. Successfully dewormed my first group of sheep. I wouldn't say flock, right? Because that's a small little That group. is small. <laughs> <laughs> so for the viewers at home, if you need dewormed, you know who to call. With well, such a rich legacy, this is a family operation, right? Yes. And are your kids involved in this? They are. My middle daughter likes the livestock, the sheep and goats, the horses. Um, she's who we're looking at as, as being this next generation, and so we're training her that direction. Now Jill's daughter Leah is teaching me how to give the lambs a little pedicure. You want to hold them up against the fence so they can't wiggle as much. Okay. And this here is all ex extra hoof that's starting to grow under. Oh, you can see it kind of curving. Mm -hmm. And now it's my turn to give it a shot. I should probably get this little curved section there, right? <laughs> oh, really? And then his, his heels aren't bad, but sometimes their heel here will grow under as well, and so you have to trim that. Nice job, bud. You know, there's nothing like farming. You're so close to God and nature. You really understand life cycles. Um, you, know, you hear people talk about, you know, I gotta go to work again. You know, it's like, no, I get to go to work again. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's so enjoyable. The whole cycle of life, it, it happens right here. When it comes to red meat, most people are quick to identify beef, but there's another red meat at the meat counter called lamb. Sheep meat is called lamb when the animal is less than a year old, and mutton when it's older than a year. Lamb is a more tender meat than mutton. Compared to raising chickens, raising sheep is more than most people want to take on. In Washington state, there are several farms that raise sheep which produce meat and wool. There are several factors that play into producing good quality lamb's meat primarily how the animal is fed and cared for. In the U.S., there's a big push for lean meat, but much of lamb's flavor is derived from the marbling of fat. If you've never cooked lamb, an internet search quickly turns up recipes like herb roasted lamb, roasted leg of lamb, lamb barley soup, Irish lamb stew, and simple grilled lamb chops. Lamb is also part of the Mediterranean diet, which research shows reduces the risk of heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Part of lamb's health benefits are found in its impressive nutrient profile, being high in heart-healthy monounsaturated fat and an excellent source of vitamin B12, which our bodies use for energy and nerve function. So the next time you're at the meat counter or farmer's market looking for another red meat, don't be sheepish about asking for the lamb. Coming up, we're back at Tilth with famous chef Maria Hines to cook up a lamb dish. Mmm, it's really delicate. So I'm with Sarah Smith, and she is the coordinator of the Washington State Shearing School. It's actually a trailer that uh, people come to, and, and you teach them how to shear. And there are a lot of people here wanting there, to learn this. There is. We're a full school, so that's 16 beginners, and we'll have um, eight advanced coming in. But I also already have 20 on the waiting list, and we don't even do an advertisement anymore. It's all by word of mouth. So who are your students? Our students are a whole variety of students. We have people who have sheep and who want to be able to shear their own. There's some people that are from downtown Seattle and say, I've seen this and I just want to get back to my heritage. My, my father had some mules with wool, so I want to try that. We have young, we have some more seasoned people that come in and it's a lot of work, but there's also a lot of rewards that they get. How do you shear a sheep? Is there a technique to it? Not only do you have to learn the contours of the sheep, you have to learn how those different fibers harvest off the equipment. And then sometimes those sheep don't quite get the memo that they need to set in their lap. And because it's taken them a little bit longer because they're learning, 
it can, it's, it's physically exhausting. And you know, some of these sheep, they look little, but they're probably weighing 200, 220 pounds. So it is a workout. You know, they are strong and sometimes they enact their will on sure. us. Sure. So how does shearing affect the sheep? You know, shearing is one of those necessities that we need to do for, for comfort of the animal. And I think if you were standing back looking at it, sometimes the position of the lamb might look uncomfortable. However, for the overall maintaining health of it, it's a necessity. And if you have a good, well-trained shearer, sheep that have been properly managed, it really provides them a comfort and provides them better care later on. Okay, so you're gonna show us. We're gonna show you. Can't we're wait, okay. Shear sheep. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Sarah showed me some of the basic shearing techniques. I think it's cool how, how basically it just all comes off in one, if you do it right. After some convincing, I decided to give it a shot. Okay. This is the part that I did right there. <laughs> Why do we shear sheep? Especially wool sheep, they have two products that we can get from them, wool and meat, and so we need to shear the sheep for two reasons. One, it's a product that we can harvest and sell for human use, but also to maintain their care and, and well-being. Um, sheep that aren't sheared, they can get uh, health issues, and, and we need to remove that from them. Yeah, Sarah, thank you so much for uh, inviting us here to see some shearing. And thank you. It's such a neat thing to be, to be able to show the people on Washington Ground. We love it. We're back in Seattle at Tilth. I've spent a lot of time in Italy, and the result that I had was absolutely outstanding. It was just an experience. I loved it. It's one of three Maria Hines restaurants, all of which feature fresh, local ingredients with seasonal menus created by the renowned chef. You've cooked with Martha Stewart. You've been an Iron Chef. Tell me a little bit about, about Tilth. The cuisine is new American. Uh, we source as much as we can locally. It's really cozy. Yeah, exactly. Really cozy, farm to table. Now we're off to the kitchen to whip up one of Maria's favorite dishes. We are gonna get down and dirty in the kitchen. What are we gonna do? Uh, well, we're gonna continue representing Washington State with a little bit of lamb loin, and we're gonna serve it with cheesy grits and some sweet and sour cherries. That sounds delicious. Yeah. Okay. Should we get started? Yeah. Our first step is to truss the lamb loin so it cooks evenly and those juices stay in the meat. Then we heavily salt it and let it sit for a few minutes to absorb. Then we slowly add our grits to some warm milk, chicken stock, and salt. You want to add it in nice and slowly so it doesn't get lumpy on you. While our grits cook, we move on to our cherries, adding them to a pan along with a dash of salt. Stone fruits go really well with lamb. Yeah. You could use apricots, that would be really delicious okay. as well. There's actually five different microclimates in Washington State, so we have a diversity in the product that we have access to. We're Washington is a great state. Yeah. We have it I, all. You know, I actually <laughs> moved here just for all the beautiful food we have access to. Once our cherries are hot, we add in red wine vinegar and sugar and let those simmer. Next, we're gonna cook the lamb. Okay. And then when you set it in the pan, uh -huh. I like to set it down and then move it away from me. So that way, if there's any oil splash, the oil splash is gonna go back and not onto right. your wrist That's a good, or your hand. Good trick that we should all yeah. know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna let the meat sear probably like three minutes okay. on one side, and then we'll let it sear for another three minutes on the other side. And then we're gonna let it sit and rest. And the reason why we want it to rest is we want the juices to kind of reabsorb back into all of the meat. A lot of times people have a tendency to not let it rest and when they slice it, um, it starts to uh, kind of bleed out all those delicious juices that you're trying to capture. Yeah. See how our polenta is doing here. It's starting to thicken up really mm -hmm. nice. It looks good. And polenta, grits, kind of the same thing, right, basically? Yes, absolutely. Then we throw in some butter and cheese. Once our cherries are done cooking, we pull them out and reduce the liquid. We're just gonna let it simmer mm -hmm. until the liquid cooks down probably to about a third of its volume. Okay. And it'll really intensify the flavor. And then Syrupy can, and yeah. Yeah, and then we can use that as the sauce. Once our liquid is reduced, we cool it off. Now that the lamb is finished, we take it off the heat and let it rest for a few minutes. 
This is the point where we have a glass of wine, chat. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's time to play. First, we scoop up our polenta and add our cherries. Then we cut off the string from our lamb loin, slice it up, and place it on top. Just a couple cherries on top so you can see them. And it's all finished off with some arugula and our cherry sauce. Look at how pretty that makes it. And now the taste test. Let's dig in. I love this. Mmm. It's really delicate. Like the whole mm -hmm. dish kind of comes together and it's just a party for your mouth. You can put that on your menu. Oh, great, great. <laughs> you can quote Excellent. me. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> to get the recipe for Chef Maria's lamb dish, log on to our website at wagrone.com. Coming up, we're heading to a sheep dairy in Bellingham to make some sheep cheese. That is delicious. It is really light and creamy. And we're in the kitchen at Second Harvest using lamb to cook up a classic Indian dish. I'm in Bellingham at Ring of Trees. It's a sheep dairy and creamery where I'm going to learn about yet another commodity we can get from sheep, cheese. I spoke with owner Fred Gustafson about the unique product. How does sheep's milk cheese, how is it different than cow's milk cheese? Is there a difference? From a cow, you'll get about a pound of cheese per gallon of milk. From sheep, you'll get two pounds of cheese per gallon of milk. It's actually that much thicker and richer of a milk. So it's a good cheese-eating experience. It's a good cheese-eating experience. <laughs> it really flows through your mouth and it makes it great. Are there nutritional differences? So the nutrition is very similar. What type of products does Ring of Trees produce? We do our Manchego-style cheeses. We do a ricotta from the whey. Um, we do feta. And we do halloumi. Like a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time to see what this sheep cheese making is all about. First things first though, we need to get our sheep's milk. Well, right now we have the cups hooked up so it's pulling milk out and it's pulsating as it pulls the milk out and it all comes into there. Once the container is full, the milk is taken over to the creamery. We head over there to meet up with Fred's wife Sherry who's working on a batch of their famous Ingrid's Pride cheese. So this is Ingrid's Pride. This is something that I invented by mistake. The milk has been pasteurized and cultured, and we check it for a clean break. Because it broke in a clean line, we're good to go. Then Sherry asks me to help cut the curds. We cut up and down. We're going to do this till we've gone all the way around. And side to side. You're going to use some muscle, don't you? Uh-huh. <laughs> Once the curds are cut, they're agitated, and we move on to the process called hooping. The curds are drained and placed into molds to make the cheese smooth and compact. Then the cheese is pressed and flipped a few times before it's ready to dry. This is when the cheese gets its outer skin. You feel it? You can feel there's a skin on there. Yeah. It's not rubbery and wet like it would have right. been. We put the cheese in what the Gustafsons call their cheese cave to start aging. They come in here for about two months, and then after two months, we go ahead and seal them and let it continue aging sealed. Some people like them three to five months, some people like them a year. So tell me what some of these are. A plain Manchego style, Manchego style with saffron, um, Manchego style with rosemary and garlic. Those flavors sound amazing. We play. Um, I started with the base manchego and we've kind of jumped off from that. After all our hard work, I was ready to give this sheep's cheese a try. And here's some Ingrid's okay. Pride for you to try. That is delicious. It is really light and creamy. I love it. You know, I love cheese. And I would love to take this to Seattle for some friends. Right? Thanks, guys. All right. I think we've just been robbed. You took our cheese. You took our cheese. I have this piece. I'm not going to share it either. <laughs> okay, Kim, do you like cheese? Yes. 
Tell me some of your favorite dishes with cheese. Ah, uh, well, pizza comes to mind. Mac and cheese. Ah, uh, enchiladas. Ooh, tacos. Oh, he's speaking my language. Maybe I just eat cheese by itself. But... Right, an all-time favorite of mine is just a good cheeseburger. Cheese and crackers and wine. <laughs> I have some cheese here that's right here from Washington State, and I'd love for you to try it and tell me what you think. Describe that to me. It's got a lot of flavor to it. It tastes more like kind of a dry cheese. Creamy. Okay. Buttery. It's a strong cheese. Do you like it? Yeah, it's quite tasty. Kind of a hint of Parmesan in there. This is actually Schutz cheese. Oh, sheep okay. Okay. It's called cool. Ingrid's Pride. It's a Manchego style cheese. Now that I've told you that, is it different? It's like a little creamier than what Parmesan would be like. I would have never guessed sheep cheese. Have you ever had sheep's cheese before? No. No, not that I know of. Now, if I told you that was sheep's cheese, would you would you know the difference? I would not. I would not. Know anything? Mm -mm, I would have known. But you enjoy it. It's very good. If it's Ingrid's Pride, she should be very proud of it. <laughs> that's fantastic. Would this be good for some crackers and wine? Absolutely. We should go get some. Okay. <laughs> We're in the kitchen at Second Harvest, and I'm with Kristen, and what are we gonna make? Today we're gonna make an Indian dish called Rogan Josh. Really? I've yes. never heard of that. Sounds like one of my ex-boyfriends from high school. <laughs> <laughs> it's a traditional Indian dish, uh -huh. and it's great for really accentuating lamb's nice, meaty, like beef, it's one of those solid yeah. pieces of meat. We have some boneless leg of lamb here. Okay. And I'm gonna trim off some of the fat. Okay. And while I do that, can you help me by Dicing an onion. Okay. So this has lots of really nice flavors in it. It does. Did you grow up eating lamb? I did not, no. In fact, I don't think I had lamb until maybe 10 years ago. Really? You know, but then you kind of get hooked you, you, on yeah, the flavor. Yeah, you do, you get hooked. My mom used to make lamb, not, I mean, maybe once or twice a year. It's kind of a special occasion yeah. food. That's the way it is with my family too. It's a special occasion yeah. kind of thing. And we'd have it with uh, mint jelly. Mm -hmm. I think that's how a lot of people mm -hmm. have had it. Yeah. When we have it, we'll grill it. Oh, yeah. And we'll have it with um, more of a Greek style, you know, mm -hmm. with Lemon. yogurt and, yeah. Oregano. Yeah, and... exactly. Well, you'll see today, we're going to let this simmer for quite a long time, okay. for about an hour. And it really soaks in all these nice curry flavors. And mm -hmm. we add some yogurt, and the yogurt just helps tenderize it. So you just get this really nice bites of lamb mm -hmm. that just fall apart in your mouth. It's okay. a great, great way to introduce lamb to someone who's never tried it or maybe... What about your kids? My kids like they lamb. They do? Yeah. Do you try to introduce new flavors and ethnic foods to your children? We kind of have this expectation that we're all gonna try whatever it is mm -hmm. that we're making. I think everybody has foods you naturally do and don't love. Mm -hmm. But like, you never know if you're gonna try it some way that can make you love something you didn't before. Right. Exactly. Then I mince up some garlic and ginger while Kristen finishes cutting our lamb. Where do you usually find lamb? Can you just go to the just your grocery store butcher or? Yeah, every grocery store butcher will have it. The leg of lamb without the bone in it is mm -hmm. a really, it's actually a pretty easy cut of lamb to find. Right. And you can see lamb trims pretty easily. It so does. it's not too bad. So just I'm, cut it into chunks for kind of stew size. Yeah, basically. about stew size. And then I'm gonna generously salt them. Then we brown our lamb in some canola oil to lock in those juices and flavor. Once our lamb is browned, we pull it out and add in our onions. And you've made this for your family before, I right? have, many times. And you also made it for a visitor that you had. We have, yeah, a dear friend of ours who is from India. And so I made it for him. And then what did he say? He said I make a mean Rogan Josh. That had to have been a great compliment. It was. Once our onions are soft, we add in the garlic, ginger, and curry powder. I'm just gonna saute this for a minute. When you get the curry, the spices nice and hot, mm -hmm. then it helps to kind of toast them and develop a, even a deeper, richer okay. curry yeah. flavor. When you're cooking with spices like this in a curry and you're gonna make those spices really nice and strong, you never wanna stop stirring. Oh, okay. Because it's you don't so want to burn. easy to burn them. Yeah. Yep. 
Wow, this makes your whole house just smell, smell delicious. Mm -hmm. This is one of those dinners you smell down the block. Yeah. And you know, yeah, that's my dinner. special <laughs> yeah, is exactly. happening. Then we stir in our tomatoes, some water, yogurt, salt, and our browned lamb. And then we're gonna bring it to a low boil, just when mm -hmm. it starts to really simmer. Okay. Then we're gonna cover it and let it simmer for an hour. So we're broken. Josh has been simmering for almost an hour. Okay, so it's ready to go then. And we're ready to eat. Awesome. You can it smell. smells amazing. It does. We have some basmati rice right there here for us. Okay. Look at how beautiful that is. And you can serve this with naan if you mm. would rather have it mm -hmm. that way. And then you can use your naan to soak up all that sure. yummy broth, which just goes right into our rice. That is. It's so fragrant. You can it is. It get is an so idea of how it's going to taste just before. Cool house smell. Amazing. Okay. Um, do it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that lamb melts in his so mouth. So tender. And all those nice curry flavors. It's not oh, too I spicy. Love the curry. No, it's not. It's flavorful, but not spicy. Mm -hmm. And I can tell those onions you chopped are making all the difference. This tastes amazing. <laughs> <laughs> to get Kristen's Rogan Josh recipe, head to our website at wagrown.com. As you can see, sheep provide diverse products, and they're another one of our important commodities produced right here in our state. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. Hopefully they won't eat my shoelaces. <laughs> Thanks for watching.